The first item of business today is consideration of business motion 382 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Business Bureau setting out a revision to the business programme for today. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 382. Formally moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion. I will therefore put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion 382 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Uh, the ministerial statement will be taken at 2.40 after portfolio questions and decision time will be moved to 5.30 uh, tonight as a, a consequence. I'm conscious that members will want to hear the statement from the, uh, on the Queensbury Crossing and question the Cabinet Secretary uh, on developments. Uh, however, I'm also aware that there has been very little notice of the statement for members and for the general public, and that's not the way I would necessarily want business to be planned. I would therefore ask the Minister and fellow Bureau members to reflect on this for the future, as I will be. And I move to the next item of business, which is portfolio questions on health and sport. And the first question is from Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Lanarkshire and what matters were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Ministers and government officials regularly meet with representatives of all health boards, including NHS Lanarkshire, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and thank the Minister for her response. The Minister will recall that I campaigned to stop the downgrading of Monkland's A&E, and I was pleased when her government stepped in to instruct the Health Board to overturn the decision. We are now facing increasing cuts to local health services in Monklands, including closure of the dermatology ward, the CIC clinic, as well as another proposal to downgrade the A&E with the removal of orthopaedic trauma. Will she step in to stop these cuts, and specifically, will she instruct the Board that downgrading the A&E is as unacceptable now as it was in 2007? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, Elaine Smith is quite right to uh, remember that it was, of course, this government in 2007 that reversed the Labour plans to close the A&E department at Monklands Hospital. Since then, local people have benefited from over 500,000 attendances at the A&E department. Well, and local communities uh, can be assured that this government remains committed to a viable future for Monklands Hospital, including the A&E department. That's why, of course, we've welcomed NHS Lanarkshire's preparation of a business case for the redevelopment of Monklands Hospital. Um, that will be a, a very important investment within the local area. As Elaine Smith knows, um, there is a, a, a trauma orthopaedics review ongoing. No decisions have been made. I've been assured that all stakeholders will be fully involved as this process is taken forward. In reference to the dermatology services, uh, she will be aware of the correspondence that I've sent to her. I'm very uh, happy to continue uh, uh, if there are any other issues arising that haven't been answered in the correspondence that I sent uh, to her, but hopefully I've been able to assure her that, uh, that the, the number of um, dermatology patients requiring hospital admission uh, has dropped and more and more are being treated as outpatients, and that's what lies behind that change. Thank you. Can I just ask uh, Kate Forbes, have you pressed your request to speak button for an intervention now for later? For, la no, for later, that's fine. Uh, can I call Margaret Mitchell? The presiding officer, the most recent delayed discharge figures for NHS Lanarkshire released in May and excluding Code 9 delays reveal that there were 123 patients prevented from leaving hospital as an inpatient. This is the highest level for any month so far this year and almost twice the number compared with this time last year. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain what's being done to address this unacceptable increase? The member is quite right to highlight how important this is and of course discussions are going on with uh, both the, the partnerships covering North Lanarkshire and South Lanarkshire. She may be aware that the particular, there is a particular issue in South Lanarkshire which is, uh, lies behind some of these delays. I can assure her that officials are engaging very closely indeed with that partnership to ensure that uh, they take the action that we know works and has worked in other partnerships to reduce delayed discharge. Uh, she will be aware, obviously, of the significant investment being made in both of those partnership areas uh, by the Scottish Government to tackle delayed discharge, but I'm very happy to keep the member uh, closely informed of South Lanarkshire's plans going forward uh, to tackle what is a very, very important issue. Thank you. Can I just clarify also, Emma Harper, are you pressing to speak now or for later? 
for now. In that case, I call Emma Harper. Okay. Thank you, President Officer. It's to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to boost GP recruitment. It's Sorry, Ms. Harper, what I meant was, were you asking a supplementary on the first question? You're down to ask question six. So I'll call you for question six at okay. that point. All right, sorry. So just, just for guidance to members, um, if you're down on the order paper for today, you can, only, you can just wait until your turn comes or press your button at that point. If you press your button during someone else's question, I will think you want to ask a supplementary on the question that's being asked there and then. Okay, so both Kate Forbes and Emma Harper, I think, are asking for later. Okay. So I'm now going to come to John Lamott, number two on the question paper. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to ensure that operations scheduled by NHS boards go ahead as planned. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government continues to work to support health boards to manage their capacity planning to keep cancelled operations to a minimum. Decisions to cancel a patient's operation is never taken lightly. Any postponed operations will be rescheduled at the earliest opportunity. The latest figures for cancelled operations published by ISD on the 7th of June show that for the month of April 2016, only 1.6% of operations were cancelled by the hospital due to capacity or non-clinical reasons. That's a reduction on the month before. Mr Lamond. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I think we all agree that cancelled operations are a waste of resources and an inconvenience to patients. In NHS borders, half of all operations cancelled in the latest month were cancelled due to capacity or non-clinical reasons. The figure is regularly twice the national average. Given the NHS borders is having to cancel such a, such a large percentage of operations due to a lack of resources, will the Scottish Government look closely at whether rural health boards are being sufficiently resourced to help with issues such as recruitment? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the member raises um, a very important point, and as I said in my initial answer, uh, progress is being made, and if you look at the figures, there's a tiny number of operations that are cancelled due to, to uh, non-clinical reasons. Uh, the vast majority of operations that are cancelled are due to either patient choice or clinical reasons. However, he highlights, obviously, that um, within uh, NHS borders, um, it is at a higher rate than, than we would like. There is a lot of work underway to try to improve the level of cancellations by, for example, a week weekly review of orthopaedic theatre lists six weeks in advance planning for staffing theatre time and equipment, booking on the basis of average time per consultant to carry out procedures for orthopaedics, reviewing admissions per ward, area per day and smoothing surgical flow, um, reviewing data for orthopaedics, looking at uh, the, implementing a process to review lists uh, every week to develop a standard operating procedure. I can write to the member with more detail around that, but please be assured that we are working very closely with NHS Borders to make those improvements. And ask Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Minister um, how many procedures have been referred to private hospitals because of a lack of capacity in our NHS and if there is a cost for doing this? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, the member will be aware that use of the independent sector um, is only used at the margins where that is required because there is no uh, capacity available within the locality, but it is very much at the margins. If you look at the uh, level of spend in the private sector, um, that um, is a, a matter that is reducing, but importantly, the elective centres that we're investing 200 million in uh, over the, the next few years are an important way of dramatically reducing that independent sector spend, which is really contained to um, a very small number of boards. The vast majority of boards hardly use the independent sector at all. There are probably one or two boards who use it more than others. With these elective centres, and particularly obviously in the east, two of those centres will be located within the Lothian area. That will make a big difference in growing that capacity so that their reliance on the independent sector is reduced further. Happy to write to the member with further details about that. Question number three, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support the PAMIS campaign changing places toilets. Cabinet Secretary. Minister. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The Scottish Government actively supports the PAMIS campaign to increase the number of changing places toilets in Scotland. We congratulate PAMIS on their substantial achievements in developing this campaign, which has so far resulted in 136 changing places toilets being installed throughout Scotland. The Scottish Government will continue to work in partnership with PAMIS as it develops a network of changing place and accessible toilets throughout Scotland, enabling those with the most complex needs to have access to their communities. Mr Lyle. 
thank the Minister for the answer and can I share with the Chamber how inspired I was in meeting uh, one of my constituents, Sheila Johnson, and her son, Mason, who opened my eyes to the issue of changing places, toilets. In response to the Minister's answer, can I ask, further ask what action the Scottish Government can take to support places of interest or tourist attractions to installing changing places toilets to help allow disabled or physically challenged visitors to access their services fully? Yes, sir. Uh, I thank Richard Lyle for raising this important issue and would uh, be pleased to know the thoughts and views of Sheila and Mason and invite the member to write to me with them. In 2015, the Scottish Government published our draft delivery plan for 2016 to 2020 in response to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which sets out our aims to ensure disabled people in Scotland have the same freedom, dignity, choice and control over their lives as everybody else. Regarding tourism, Visit Scotland is currently running an accessible tourism project which aims to work with the tourism industry to boost accessibility for all disabled people. Through this project, tourist businesses are now able to showcase their accessibility credentials via access statements. These statements can be used to feature changing places toilets where these facilities already exist. And the member should also visit the Changing Places UK map, which shows the full list of changing places toilets throughout Scotland, including uh, several in his own constituency. Question number four, Finlay Carson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will review the referral pathways that results in cancer patients in Stranraer having to travel to Edinburgh via Dumfries rather than cancer services in Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the role of the Scottish Government is to provide policies, frameworks and resources to NHS boards in order that they can deliver services that meet the needs of their local population. Within this context, the actual planning and provision of healthcare services is the responsibility of local health boards taking into account national guidance, local service needs and priorities for investment. However, I am aware that NHS Dumfries and Galloway has confirmed that they are currently reviewing their cancer referral pathways to ensure that people with cancer do not have to travel unnecessarily for treatment. Mr Carson. It is uh, also my understanding uh, that it is only patients' uh, transport that goes via Dumfries to Edinburgh and car users can actually go to Glasgow. Uh, would the Minister agree that the Government should seek the health boards and providers to develop the pathways to stop uh, this inequality, uh, particularly those affected which affect clinical outcomes, uh, in this case, uh, travel? Secretary. Well, you know, I, I would expect uh, health boards, uh, wherever they are, to deliver as many of their cancer services as locally as possible. However, it is important to recognise that some complex treatments can only be delivered via specialist centres. So that's obviously a clinical decision on where best the, the person uh, goes, and that would be determined in close discussion uh, with the consultant and the clinical team. I mean, in terms of the transport issues that uh, he raises, I'm sure that um, NHS Dumfries and Galloway are more than aware of those issues. Um, I mean, it, it, essentially, it is important that people with cancer do not have to travel unnecessarily for treatment wherever that is to. And it's important, though, when they do have to travel, it is to the place that's most appropriate for them. However, I'm very happy to uh, you know, keep in contact with the, the member as Dumfries and Galloway take these issues forward. And I'm sure he'll be feeding in his views to the local health board um, through um, um, the, uh, Mr. Mr Ace, Jeff Ace, the, the chief exec, and I would encourage him to do so. Question number five, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it's taking to help reduce waiting times at GP surgeries. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is fully committed to reducing waiting times at GP surgeries. We've increased the primary care fund in the draft 16-17 uh, budget, which will now deliver £85 million of investment over three years. That will include £20.5 million on the primary care transformation programme as allocated to boards to support work at practice and wider multidisciplinary team level, £6 million to develop digital services, including helping online appointment booking, £16.2 million to recruit 140 new pharmacists to work directly with practices and support the care of patients with long-term conditions. And of course, we're working closely with the BME and the Royal College of GPs to reduce GP workload. And this includes our pioneering agreement to abolish the bureaucratic system of GP payments in order to free up more GP time to spend with patients. Colin Beattie. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware that uh, many surgeries in my constituency of Midlothian, North and Musselburgh are closed to new patients. 
yet house building continues apace. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree there is a need to balance infrastructure against development to ensure that constituent medical needs can be met? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, Colin Beattie makes a, an important point. Um, since 2007, the Scottish Government has invested over £170 million of capital in projects delivering new or refurbished GP premises across Scotland. In addition, the Government's uh, hub programme is delivering over £500 million worth of community healthcare infrastructure. Planning should take into account current infrastructure capacity and indeed future requirements, and this applies to all types of infrastructure, including primary healthcare provision. The delivery of more high quality homes is a, a key priority and to that end we published draft guidance on planning for housing and infrastructure delivery earlier this year and the recent independent review of the Scottish planning system has made a number of recommendations aimed to strengthen planning for infrastructure which are currently under consideration. Question number six, Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. It's to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to boost GP recruitment. Cabinet Secretary. Oh, the number of GPs in Scotland has increased by 7% under this government and we want to go further and faster to boost GP numbers as part of building a strong multidisciplinary community health service. We are funding support to GP returners provided by NHS uh, Education for Scotland. Um, we have increased the number of GP training places from 300 to 400. I will soon be in a position to announce the details of the latest package of funding being distributed under the 2.5 million GP Recruitment and Retention Fund, which will include a range of innovative projects to tackle recruitment issues, including those faced by rural and remote areas. In the longer term, we are committed to delivering a national workforce plan that will set out how we will address workload and capacity by building those multidisciplinary teams, including boosting GP numbers and, of course, our three million commitment to train 500 more advanced nurse practitioners. Emma Harper. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. Does she agree with me that the Scottish Government's measures to boost GP recruitment will bring enormous benefits to the healthcare provision in rural parts of Scotland, including my own area of Dumfries and Galloway. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, uh, I do agree with that. Uh, we are taking a, a number of actions, but there is uh, more to be done. And of course, one of the key uh, components of, of transforming primary care, um, uh, the new models that we're testing in primary care along the lines of the community health hubs, multidisciplinary working. And what will underpin that, of course, is the new GP contract that will uh, take place from 2017 onwards. That is being negotiated uh, as we speak um, with the BMA. Uh, discussions are going well. And that has to be a, a, a contract that will uh, help to deliver a radically different model of primary care, which will benefit remote and rural Scotland as well as urban Scotland. Kate Forbes. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that in the rural highlands it can be difficult for an increasingly ageing and scattered population to get to GP appointments. So what progress is the Scottish Government making to increase home-based options such as telecare, currently used by over 2,000 people in NHS Highland, without replacing contact time with healthcare workers? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as part of the Scottish Government's technology-enabled care programme, uh, over a million pounds is being made available to NHS Highland and its partners over the next two years. This funding is to drive forward the uptake of technology-enabled care services, which includes telecare across the Highland and Argyll and Butte partnership areas. That's in addition to the £973,000 awarded to Highland and Argyll and Butte during 2015-16, uh, as well as the significant funding provided to both areas over the last few years to de develop uh, Living It Up Scott as part of their local strategy to raise public awareness of the benefits of technology-enabled care. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. G given that we have clinics closing now due to the immediate crisis uh, and hospitals such as Lockhart's and Lanark not taking new patients, and it takes several years to train a GP, what action is being taken now to deal with the immediate short-term crisis? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, the member may be aware that uh, I recently, just a few weeks ago, um, uh, just before um, the election, uh, announced a 20 million package for this financial year. 
uh, which covered many of the workload issues that GPs themselves said could help to relieve some of the pressures. Uh, that was uh, uh, very well received by the profession uh, and it was um, intended to address some of the short term issues, but it is without doubt the medium to long term that will make the biggest transformation because although yes that resource and uh, investment is important to tackle workload issues the new contract and the new model of primary care is fundamental to changing primary care and making it a more attractive proposition for medical undergraduates not enough medical undergraduates are choosing primary care as their specialist uh, option once they qualify and that is uh, an issue that has to be changed and a new model of primary care and a new contract will help make that more attractive and we're working very closely with the profession to deliver that. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, one of the issues is that Scotland, of course, uh, is excellent in terms of training doctors, but that means that uh, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand often try and poach some of these newly trained uh, uh, doctors. What can we do to try and mitigate against that, given that these people uh, are offering a different lifestyle, perhaps, than the folk who uh, are born and educated and trained here would enjoy if they stayed in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, what I can say to Kenneth Gibson is that uh, through our uh, recruitment uh, campaign for junior doctors, that's actually had a very, very positive response across uh, a number of specialties. Uh, certainly the numbers are, are well up on last year. Now, obviously, we need that to translate uh, through to appointments. Um, but, you know, the indications are that Scotland is being seen as an attractive place uh, by junior doctors to come and train here. There still, though, is an issue with, uh, with general practice, and that is mirrored across these islands. Uh, and, of course, we are in an international competitive environment. So part of the solution is to uh, make sure that our training environment is uh, 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 internationally recognised and is somewhere where junior doctors want to come and train and there are some e there's evidence of some success of that. But we also want to grow more of our own doctors, which is why, of course, we're taking forward the first graduate entry programme for medicine here in Scotland. And I hope to be in a position to say something more about that over the next few weeks. Donald Cameron. Um, already in this parliament, we've heard much about the, the crisis in GP staffing. Um, but what plans does the Scottish Government have to boost recruitment by reducing, in particular, stress levels and the workload of GPs? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I said in my earlier answer, the £20 million that uh, I announced uh, a few months ago uh, for this financial year was new money intended to help with some of those short-term workload issues. These were things that were called for by the profession that could help to um, uh, reduce uh, some of that workload. The getting rid of the COAF, of course, was a, a major step forward because it was seen as a, a bureaucratic system that was a tick box system and took a lot of GP time. And that was very warmly welcomed when we uh, took the decision to um, uh, get, get rid of the, the COAF system. But as I've said to others in this chamber, those short-term measures are important, but it's the new models of primary care and the new contract that I believe will make the biggest difference to being able to recruit, retain, and importantly, get young doctors to choose general practice as their, their choice of, of spe speciali spe specialism. Um, and that is work that we are undertaking with the profession. And if we get the new contract right, I think we'll be able to do that. Question number seven, Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what timetable it is working to in its pledge to examine extending the minor ailment service. Cabinet Secretary. As I'm sure Jamie Green will appreciate, considerations about extending the minor ailment service are at a, an early stage following the First Minister's statement on the 25th of May uh, taking Scotland forward. Detailed scoping work is, um, needs to be undertaken first, all taking into account, for example, the cost of an extended service, the capacity within community pharmacies, the wider primary care transformation agenda, and how to better support self-care as a core part of the service going forward. Over the coming weeks, we're going to engage with NHS boards, Community Pharmacy Scotland, and other stakeholders on the, uh, the options and associated timeframes, and I'm happy to keep the member informed of the progress being made. Jimmy Green. 
Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer and also welcome her commitment to extending the minor ailment service uh, as set out in our manifesto and ask what extra funding will be allocated in the first instance. Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, of course, we do um, invest um, a significant amount of resource in uh, community pharmacy already. The community pharmacy remuneration global sum is just over £178 million. That's a million pounds increase on the previous year. And of course, uh, in addition, community pharmacy contractors will earn a minimum of £93.5 million in reimbursement from the purchase of drugs on behalf of NHS Scotland as part of the overall funding settlement. He will appreciate that negotiations with Community Pharmacy Scotland about the extension uh, of the minor ailment service will have a resource component uh, to it. And I think it would be more appropriate to have those discussions rather than to uh, uh, put out arbitrary figures uh, in this chamber. So they appreciate that that will be part of the discussions going forward. Uh, what I would say to the member though is that what we are doing here with community pharmacy is in stark contrast to that south of the border where pharmacies in England face a potential reduction of up to 6%, some £170 million reduction. If that happens, what pharmacies are saying in England, that there will be far-reaching consequences for that, with uh, many of them saying that there will be the potential closure of pharmacies in many areas. I hope the members reassured we're not taking that action here in Scotland. Question number eight, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the average weight was for child and adolescent mental health services in the NHS Forth Valley region for patients who started their treatment in the last quarter of 2015. Minister Maureen Wood. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The average wait, waiting time for the quarter ending December 2015 in NHS Forth Valley was 22 weeks. I'm disappointed that the board is still to achieve the waiting time standard for CAMS. However, month on month, the average waiting time decreased throughout the quarter and was down by seven weeks by December 2015. In the most recent Scotland-wide data for the quarter ending March 2016, which was published on yesterday, the percentage of children and young people seen within the waiting time standard increased on the previous quarter, with half of patients seen within eight weeks. NHS Forth Valley's performance against the standard increased by 10%. I welcome that progress, however, it's still far from good enough. I expect the board to increase their efforts to meet the waiting time standards, and I will be paying close attention to this and to ensure that all boards are meeting the waiting time standard sustainably. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Minister, for, for that response. Um, we also welcome those uh, small recent improvements in performance, but um, we, we would highlight that further progress is required with regard to uh, the performance of the NHS board in, in Forth Valley. The fact that our youngest and most vulnerable people in this area have to wait approximately four or five months for treatment uh, for, for mental health issues is, is clearly unacceptable, especially considering that early diagnosis and treatment is critical for successful outcomes. Um, given these uh, disappointing overall figures, and in particular for um, the Fourth Valley NHS, will the Minister and the Government follow the advice uh, published yesterday by the Scottish Children's Service Services Coalition to put in place an urgent action plan, not only for this uh, NHS Fourth Valley region, but also across Scotland to increase investment in mental health and uh, uh, put additional resources in this area? Yes. Uh, well, of course, the member will be aware that the Scottish Government is putting in extra resources, uh, 150 million. And in terms of the strategy, of course, the strategy will take into account the requirements not only of those in Forth Valley, but uh, throughout Scotland. But I can say that um, the, uh, the service, the CAM service in Forth Valley, has gone through a significant period of redesign in the last year. There's been investment in the CAM service with new nursing and psychology posts. Uh, a new management structure has been established with clear lines of responsibility and accountability and there's now a dedicated manager for the service and lead roles have been established for each speciality and also a new CAMS website went live on the 1st of June with a range of self-help material but of course NHS Forth Valley will have to do more to meet the standards. 
Question number nine, Joanne Lamond. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will announce the final 2016-17 budgets for health boards and integrated joint boards. Cabinet Secretary. On the 26th of February, the Scottish Government announced 2016-17 budgets for NHS boards, taking health spending to a record level of almost £13 billion. Additional funding of more than £500 million for health boards enables investment of an additional £250 million to support the integration of health and social care and build the capacity of community-based services. The Scottish Government does not set the budgets for integrated, uh, integrated joint boards. Rather, budgets are delegated to uh, integrated joint boards by health boards and councils. Budgets were agreed for integrated joint boards by the 1st of April as planned, subject in some areas to final decisions regarding health efficiencies as part of the NHS board's local delivery plans. The Scottish Government is working to the 30th of June as the date for conclusion of local delivery plans and is providing support for this process. Joanne Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary very much for that response? But can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to outline to what extent these budgets reflect the need and the disproportionate levels of social and health challenges in and within Glasgow and whether the process for defining needs and budgets is under review. And further, could I ask the Cabinet Secretary to indicate what work has been done in particular to address the inverse care law, which means that those GP practices, very many of them in Glasgow, which are dealing with patients with the most complex needs are also the most poorly funded, perhaps creating the levels of stress and pressure that has been ready to discuss in the Chamber today. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I think Joanne Lamont makes a, an important point here. Um, I have made it very clear on a number of occasions in this Chamber that particularly when it comes to the resourcing of primary care, that there needs to be um, more of a direct correlation uh, with the Scottish allocation formula between deprivation and need and the, the budget that follows. I am very clear as part of the new GP contract and the negotiations ongoing there that that is an issue that has to be addressed as part of those discussions. Um, very happy to keep Joanne Lamont informed of how those discussions go forward. She'll obviously understand that there are many, um, you know, these discussions are, are quite sensitive and there's a lot of detail to be gone through. But I can assure her that is a very important issue for me as Cabinet Secretary to make sure that the, the resources going to our uh, deprived communities, particularly through primary care monies, better reflect the levels of need that are within those areas. Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. NHS 5 have announced that they have to make a £30 million cut in their budget, and the Health and Social Care Partnership in 5 have said that they have £11 million in a deficit. Will the Minister agree to meet with me to discuss these massive challenges facing the NHS and social care in 5? Cabinet Secretary. Well, what is important to reiterate, of course, is that uh, as well as the ad additional funding of more than £500 million, as I said in my earlier answer, half of that is going to support the integration of health and social care. And, of course, where efficiency savings are required to be made, which, of course, is the case for all of the public sector, within those territorial boards, all savings are retained locally by territorial boards for reinvestment in frontline services. Now, I'm very happy to meet with Alex Rowley. I have met recently with David Ross, the leader of the Council, and I have met recently with, with health uh, board representatives as well. What is important within NHS Fife and Fife Council, though, is as much about getting on with building up the relationships and ways of working to change the way things are done. If you look at partnerships across Scotland, many of them are making very, very good progress in tackling delayed discharge and getting on with uh, changing the way services are delivered to the benefit of service users and patients. All areas need to do that, and there is more progress needing to be made in a number of areas. And, uh, Fife is one of those areas. I'm very happy to work with Alec Rowley if he thinks, by working together, we can encourage both of those parties uh, to get on with the job of improving those local services, and I'm very happy to take him up on that. Question number 10, Bob Doris. An officer to ask the Scottish Government what consideration it is given to using the new medicines fund to ensure access to the cystic fibrosis medicine I have a cafeter for two to five year olds with the G55 1D gene. Cabinet Secretary, sorry, Minister Aileen Campbell. The new medicine fund can be used by NHS boards to support the cost of this treatment. The peer approved clinical system pilot provides a route for clinicians who want to prescribe this treatment. I would be happy to meet with the member to discuss further. 
While the Scottish Government has taken action to put in place improvements in access to new medicines, including our new medicines fund investment, pharmaceutical companies also need to take action on the prices they are charging. It would be in the best interest of people in Scotland for the manufacturer of this drug to put forward a resubmission to the Scottish Medicines Consortium at a reduced price. Bob Doris. Uh, President Officer, can I first of all thank the Minister for that answer, but also put on record uh, my thanks to Duncan McNeill, the departing chair of the Health and Sport Committee, who worked very collaboratively with the Scottish Government, as we all did as members of that committee, in relation to developing new models for access to medicines in a collegiate fashion, and access to medicines dramatically improved right across Scotland as a result. However, uh, Minister, uh, this case does raise further issues over access, and I'll be delighted to, to, to meet with the Minister to discuss it further. But can I also ask whether the Minister will ensure that the new independent Montgomery review on access to new medicines takes account of how SMC structures handle submissions such as IVACAFTA and also when access to new medicines fund would indeed be triggered? Minister. Um, well, uh, again, I, I thank the, the member for raising this uh, issue and uh, also note my thanks to the work that Duncan McNeill did in the previous uh, session. Of course, the member does know that the Cabinet Secretary has asked Dr Brian Montgomery to lead an independent review on access to new medicines and uh, the review will report to the Cabinet Secretary later on this year. Both the First Minister though, and the Cabinet Secretary have also been very clear that there has been real progress made to improve the access, but more can be done and more should be done. Uh, for example, again, and, uh, to reiterate the point I made in my reply to Bob Doris's first question, we don't always get uh, to a pharmaceutical company's best offering on price early enough or at all, so there's clearly a lot more we'd want to do. That's why the Medicine uh, Independent Review has been taking place, and again, I'm happy to meet with the uh, member to discuss that and uh, other interests he may have on this issue. Question number 11, Maurice Corrie. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. It's to ask the Scottish Government whether it will retain the current uh, level of services at the Vale of Leven Hospital. Um, Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, it was this government that ended a decade of damaging uncertainty for the hospital by approving the vision for the Vale in 2009. Local people can be assured that we remain committed to maintaining and improving services at the Vale of Leven Hospital, which includes sustaining emergency services. Mr Corrie. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Um, also, would the Scottish Government work to reintroduce full accident emergency services so that the west of Scotland, so west of the Martinshire area, has these services on the north side of the River Clyde, in view of the fact that the Royal Navy will be increasing its personnel at First Lane by some 2,000 personnel? Well, the member will no doubt be aware that there hasn't been a full a &E department at the Vale since 2002, when it was closed under the previous administration. And of course, you can't just stick an a &E department at a hospital. It's what lies behind that a &E department that is crucially important. So the Royal College of Emergency Medicine specify that a full 24-7 A&E service has to be supported by on-site 24-7 anaesthetic, surgical, critical care cover, which are not available at the Vale of Leven Hospital. Um, so you know, what we need to ensure at the Vale of Leven is the sustainability of the services that are there. That's why, of course, we fully supported the minor injury unit at the Vale, which is open from 8 o'clock in the morning to 9 p.m. every day and deals with up to 70 per cent of local unscheduled care. So 70 per cent of people who need unscheduled care get their care at the Vale of Leven Hospital. What I can assure the member is that that unit is doing well. It's experienced a 4% increase in attendances between November 2014 and November 2015. I want to make sure that the vision for the Vale is delivered because that is what has got a hospital that was on its knees mm -hmm. into a position of actually doing very well indeed. I hope the local member will support us in our efforts to do so. Question 12, Gordon Linders. Thank you, presiding officer. My question is to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had or plans to have with NHS boards and local authorities regarding disabled access in and around hospitals and other health facilities. Minister Ian Campbell. Uh, Scottish Government officials regularly meet with NHS boards to discuss a range of issues involving finance, performance and management of health care facilities. Gordon Linders. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, I have a further question, which is, does the Scottish Government agree that specific steps should be taken to require local authorities ensure the state of repair and suitability of pavements for disabled people, particularly those in wheelchairs, 
near hospitals such as the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, where the Royal Hospital for Sick Children is due to be relocated. Minister. Um, we absolutely take very seriously, and so does uh, the NHS boards across the country, about making sure there is access to uh, healthcare facilities across the, the country. I'm happy in the time we've got left, perhaps, to follow up some of the issues if the, if the member has particular issues he wants to raise uh, in more depth. But certainly, I know that there is an access audit checklist that uses inclusive design to ensure that new buildings uh, are accessible and take a whole host of different uh, vulnerabilities into consideration when designing new facilities. And that also goes, I guess, uh, as well for older buildings, which the NHS has a number of, to make sure that they are as accessible as they possibly can be. Not everything's perfect, but certainly uh, there is a range of tools in place to make sure that new buildings and the existing uh, infrastructure is uh, as accessible as it can possibly be. Thank you, Minister. And that ends this session of portfolio questions.